We have come around once again, the cycle of the Shabbat, which means a new Torah portion. Tetzaveh is our Torah portion for today. Now, um, much of our technical crew is not here today. <laughs> so uh, we have no slides. So today we're going to go a little bit old fashioned and, uh, and that's good. And we'll uh, be digging around for our own scriptures. And you also don't get to see fancy slides made with uh, uh, my title and all that. Before I speak, though, let's go to the Lord in prayer about this word. Blessed Lord our God, our Father in heaven, our King, our Creator, our Protector and Shield, you are with us always, Lord. You have left behind these texts for us to study, to understand the instructions you have left for us, to understand more about ourselves and to understand more about you, and above all, Lord, to understand how we can serve you. So I pray, Lord, that the words you'll give me today will help us along that journey. May we all have ears to hear, eyes to see, and minds to understand, and may we all put these to action. <clears throat> and I pray this all with Shem Yeshua. Tetzaveh is the name of the Torah portion. And we have a lot of visitors today, so I'll do a quick aside about Torah portions. Um, the cycle that we read is the yearly cycle of portions of the Torah. <clears throat> now, the scroll itself has no actual divisions in it. There's no punctuation. There's, uh, there are certain cleverly put spaces it's a beautiful scroll, but there's no chapters and there's no verse numbering and there's nothing like that in the original Torah scroll. And so, to divide it up into portions, when a portion is selected, they take a word from the first sentence of the portion and that becomes its title. In this uh, case, it's Tetzaveh, you shall instruct. These portions were set up originally when Ezra brought some of the Israelites back and uh, the, during that time was Zerubbabel and all to rebuild the temple. Um, he began the public reading of the Torah on a weekly basis to instruct everyone. And so he divided up these portions as they are today and we've continued to do that for 2,500 years and we are in sync with everybody in the diaspora. It's a little different in uh, Jerusalem, there, sometimes we get one Torah portion off, depending on the calendar. But that's another detail for another time. So that's why we have Torah portions. This one, Tetzaveh. I have decided to name my discussion today, my sermon, my drash, Fill Your Hands, which is something we will discuss. This Torah portion continues the narrative of the preparations for the wilderness tabernacle. This Torah portion gives us access, almost like ringside seats, to a very intimate conversation between God and Moses. And interestingly enough, in this particular Torah portion, Moses' name is never written down. We never pronounce his name in this one. <clears throat> it's unique in the entire uh, narrative of Moses from birth to death. This is the longest section where his name is not spoken. Yet, he's still at the center of this because he is the one that God is saying, you shall instruct, you shall command. It's a monologue of God to Moses. If you have a red letter Bible that has all the words of God in red, you will see this long continuous section. This is God's word. It's a long, continuous quote. <clears throat> Understanding the setting is really important, too. This occurs at the top of Mount Sinai. The top of the mountain at this time is engulfed in the storm of God's divine presence. From the outside, down below, where all the Israelites are. The Israelites are treated to this overwhelming sight of fire and smoke, of cloud and lightning, of thunder and the shofar blasts and roaring winds. Moses and God are ensconced deep within this divine storm, far from the gaze of ordinary men. From the outside, 
by our earthly reckoning, 40 days and 40 nights pass while Moses is in there. But remember that God is beyond time. Time is not something that subjects God. God subjects time. In his realm, the meeting of Moses, it's Moses' nefesh, meeting face to face with God. In that setting, there is no time. The rules of physics and time are suspended. Simply, Moses experienced exactly what we all long for, deepest within our inner being. He experienced complete communion with his creator. A 40-day fast from food or water would be devastating to the human body in this physical realm that we are in. But clearly, Moses was somehow beyond those physical needs. He dwelt in, for lack of a better word, a different dimension at that time. He dwelt in communion with God in this timeless realm, in the heavenly realm. This is something like what Yeshua told his disciples at the well in Samaria when they urged him to eat. And this is in John chapter 4, verses 31 through 32. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, in a very Jewish way, I might add, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And if you read on, you'll see. In that instance, Yeshua said his food was to do the will of the one who sent him to finish his work. That work to finish is a subtle reference, at least in part, to this biblical narrative. Where Moses received the instructions for the tabernacle where the service of God would occur to the end that sins would be covered and Israel would learn to walk in the ways of God. Yeshua would do the work to finish the purpose of the tabernacle. But because God saw fit to leave us these texts, we have the opportunity to learn more about that work and how we can live the way God intended us to live. In this beginning of this uh, portion that uh, we read for this week, God speaks very forcefully to Moses. It says, This is a double emphasis of the second person singular. Literally something like this. And you, you shall command. He doubly emphasizes it. God is placing a great responsibility on Moses in this portion. It's not where he says, tell Aaron to tell the Israelites. <clears throat> but instead he says, you, you yourself, you shall command. Teaching that he will give what must be commanded. So Moses must impart to them the central theme of the portion. Namely, the consecration of Aaron and his sons to be priests. That's what this Torah portion is about. It's the ordination of Aaron. This is a high responsibility to be the official priesthood among a nation of priests. Priests serve as mediators between the divine presence and the children of Israel. The pattern of the priesthood within Israel is therefore a lesson for all Israel as to how they are to conduct themselves as a priesthood for mankind. For this reason, we sense the personal responsibility God is commanding of Moses. You, you yourself shall see to this task. Don't have someone else do it. This is too important. In the big picture, God is instructing Israel how to serve him. There will be many fine details and particulars. The tabernacle will be built. And it says, built so that God will dwell among them. The altar where the service will occur. 
The menorah from which his light will shine. And in fact, this whole Torah portion starts off with the instructions for the oil for the menorah. It's a way of hinting at the priest's role of bringing the light to the world. The bread of the encounter that will be in that tabernacle. Um, literally in Hebrew, the bread of faces before my face. Again, a picture of encounter. The other altar where incense rises as our prayers before the throne. That's at the end of this Torah portion is the description of how to make that. These are all the particulars and they will each have a detailed service on how they are to fulfill their role of resembling the heavenly service on earth because that's what the tabernacle was about. This whole pattern was shown to Moses to make the tabernacle a reflection of the heavenly service. This is something I talk about a lot in the men's prayer group, that we are uh, paralleling the service that's going on right at that moment, right at this moment in heaven. And God will reveal all of those details to Moses in time. For now, in this very intimate encounter with Moses, God will first reveal the basic principles that are to guide the service of God's priesthood. Today we're going to draw out from this text three things, three important aspects of serving God. One of them is the manner of entering into service. Another one is how to serve. And the final one that we're going to look at is the most urgent responsibility. So first, the manner of entering into service. God starts the whole discussion of the priestly commands with a foundational statement. So turn to Exodus chapter 28 and go to verse, uh, verses 1 and 2. It says, bring your brother Aaron near with his sons from among B'nai Israel, so that they may minister to me as Kohanim. Aaron and his sons, Nadab and Avihu and Eleazar and Itamar, you are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron, for splendor and for beauty. You see, <coughs> ministering to God begins by Bringing your brother near. Those are the first words. Bring your brother near. In fact, your brother and his whole household. Service to God is manifested in the fellowship of man. I'll say that again. Service to God is manifested in the fellowship of man. Bringing near your brother is serving God. You see, we will not always be able to see the thunder and the lightning and the fire and the smoke and hear the shofar of God's divine presence, but we will always be able to draw near to our brother. Simply put, service to God is manifested in our relationship with our brother. Draw near your brother is the commandment that begins the service of the priesthood. The Torah tells us that we are made in the image of God and after the likeness of God. That's how it's stated. In the image of God and after the likeness of God. Rabbi Sam Nadler teaches that bearing the image means we are God's representatives. We represent him as bearing his image. And the likeness, the demut, gives us the ability to relate you see, something is like something else. It shares something with something else. The essence of the word likeness is relational in that sense. To be made in his likeness means that we are made to relate. We can relate to him and we can relate to one another. So the very first step in the consecration of Aaron to be a model for priestly service to the people of the priesthood is to draw near your brother. Not 
drag your brother kicking and screaming, but draw your brother near to you. Not order your brother around and assert your will over him, but rather draw him near. Relate to him with honor, with respect, and with love. When we draw our brother near, we are expressing love. And what did our Messiah say? This is in John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. If you don't want to turn there, I'll just read it. I give you a new commandment, he says, that you love one another just as I have loved you, so also you must love one another. But this, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, that wasn't a new commandment. There's a little irony in Yeshua's voice there. I hope you sense it. That is the commandment to love. Love your neighbor as yourself, we just said. This opening command is to draw near your brother. That is an act of love. This opening command then says to make holy garments for your brother for splendor and beauty. Not only are we to draw our brother near to ourselves, but we are to dress him in garments of splendor and beauty. These are kadosh garments of kavod and tiferet. Those are the words. These words, kadosh, kavod, tiferet. Those are very special words. Those are expressions of God's divine nature. He is kadosh. He is set apart. His kavod is the manifestation of his glory. Tiferet is a very important word. <clears throat> it is an element of his nature that Jewish tradition calls beauty. But Jewish tradition sees the beauty, the tiferet of God as a balance between two other aspects of God. That is his gevorah, his power, and his chesed, his loving kindness. Tiferet is a balance of gevorah and chesed. Once we draw our brother near, we clothe him in garments by bearing the image of our creator and acting that out. We relate to him in holiness by treating him with the reverence he deserves as a beloved child of God. We relate to him as a bearer of the glory of God. We relate to him by balancing our God-given power with our God-given loving kindness. Aaron's priestly garments expressed all of this and much more. He was dressed for his holy and set-apart service. And it all started with him being drawn near by his brother Moses. And we are commanded also to similarly dress our brother for holy service when we express the image of the divine which we bear within ourselves. Dressing our brother in holy garments means treating him with chesed, loving kindness. If, alternately, we do not relate to our brother with the God-given chesed, we actually tear at his garment and leave both ourselves and our brothers not dressed for service. You might say naked and afraid. We, in essence, strip him of his holy garments and in so doing, strip ourselves. And our brother is so, a brother so treated will not remain near, but instead will separate from us leaving us neither dressed nor service nor drawn near. This then is the beginnings and the foundations of what our holy service is, the actions of our lives. Listen, Israel is the nation of priests. With Yeshua, willing souls from the nations are grafted into that. That means grafted into the nations of priests. So all of these instructions for Aaron are valid for every one of us, native born and grafted in alike, because we have a responsibility as priests in the world. We are to do, just like this Torah portion is, to start to fill the lamps, to bring that oil, that lighted oil to the world. So these things Drawing near to our brother and dressing them in holy garments are our responsibility too. 
And now we get to the how we serve, the second part of what we're going to draw out of. In this Torah portion, there is contained in chapter 29, a verse I want to draw your attention to. 29 verses 8 through 9. You can turn to that while I talk for a second. This chapter tells of God's detailed command for actually dressing Aaron and his sons in their sacred vestments. We just talked a lot about dressing it. Well, the commands leading up to this part were telling Moses exactly how he's supposed to put on the ephod and the sash and all that kind of stuff. And then it will tell of the bulls and the rams of ordination and the service of the altar associated with this one-time event. But sandwiched in between is something quite marvelous. Exodus 29, 8 and 9. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics and fasten caps on them. Then tie sashes on Aaron and his sons. The priesthood is there by lasting ordinance. Then you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Then you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. That is the typical translation. You probably have something very much like it. You shall ordain. But the actual words in the Hebrew are an idiomatic phrase. Umileta yad aron ve yad veniav. Mileta. Mileta. It's a form of the word male. Some of you who have been in my class for years know that I get very excited about that, uh, that word. Male, fill, to fulfill, to bring to its fullest extent. Male, fill. This would be the Hebrew that underpins the Greek of the words Yeshua spoke when he said, I came not to abolish the law, but to male, to fulfill it, to bring it to its fullest extent. Make full, fill full. It's also the command given to Adam, fulfill the earth, make full the earth. But what is being filled here? Well, it's that simple word, yad aron, ve yad venecha. Quite simply, hand. The command for Moses doesn't say ordain him as priest. It says, fill the hands of Aaron and of his son. Our translators understood that this idiomatic phrase was intended to convey that Aaron and his son were being ordained as priests, but the simple word ordain does not capture the subtleness underneath that image. Our hands are how we do things. The Torah, we say, was given by Yad Moshe, by the hand of Moses. When we gaze at a masterpiece we say that we are looking at the hand of the artist who created it. We have working hands. We have healing hands. Hands are the chief way that mankind interacts with his environment. Hands are how we do everything. So to ordain Aaron and his lineage for priestly service, Avodah, Moses is commanded to fill their hands. This will be given a practical image in uh, chapter 29, verse 24, when Moses is given instructions. Remember all that stuff? The broad tail, the abdominal fat, half the liver, the kidneys and their fat, the right thigh, unleavened bread. It says in verse 24, you are to put the entirety into Aaron's hands and the hands of his sons and present them as a wave offering before Adonai. Frankly, yuck. Okay, it's a lot of stuff. Livers and kidneys and fats and all that kind of stuff. But, but, but that besides jovialness. Fill their hands indeed. Imagine this. This is going on for seven days. This symbolic act describes how they are to discharge their duties. Not a little bit. Not part time. Not second. Not piecemeal, but male, filled, full, completely consumed. Their hands are to be totally full of their duties as a holy priesthood. Listen, they weren't given, they weren't given land. 
they didn't have to work for a living. All of their food and everything came from the tithes of the Israelites. So they could be completely and utterly dedicated to their avodah so that their hands would be full. This then is the ordination of Aaron. Make full his hands. And indeed they will be. His duties will not be just sometimes. They will be all the times. 24-7. The priest's duties were to teach the Torah of God. <clears throat> if you want to look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17. Verse 9. This is some of the duties of Aaron. Actually, starting at verse 8, suppose a matter arises that is too hard for you to judge over bloodshed, legal claims, or assault, matters of controversy within your gates. Then you shall go up to the place Adonai, your God, chooses and come to the Levitical Kohanim and the judge in charge at the time, and you will inquire, and they will tell you the sentence of the judgment. They had the responsibility to judge the really big cases. They were the Supreme Court. Deuteronomy 33.10. The blessings of Moses speaking about Levi and Aaron. They will teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your Torah. They will put incense in your nose and whole burnt offerings on your altar. So not only that, they are the Torah teachers. He's giving them that responsibility. They were to conduct all of the detailed offerings. They were to monitor and inspect people who had been stricken with Sarat. They were called to lead the Moedim and the festivals. They were responsible for the goings on in the house of the Lord. In fact, their hands were so full of service to God that God dedicated the rest of the tribe of Levi to them to serve as shamashim, as assistants. Their hands were so full. Is it uh, that Malachi then says about them? 2.7 For a Kohen's lips should guard knowledge and instruction must be sought from his mouth for he is a messenger of Adonai Tsevot. Messenger, that's angel. That's what we call angel. So this is what is intended for the priesthood. I say intended. They were started off properly. Talking with Joe this morning, he asked the question, when did they go wrong? And I said, probably immediately. <laughs> but this is the intent. This is the responsibility that God lays on his priesthood. <clears throat> and that ordination is to take seven days. So Exodus 29:35 if you're if you're turning pages Do for Aaron and his sons everything according to what I have commanded you consecrate them for 7 days repeatedly over and over and over their hands were filled their hands were filled And again that idiomatic phrase is repeated in them 7 days you shall fill their hands that's what it says Shavat Yamim Tamale Yadam. So service to God means filling the hands. <clears throat> not part way, not a little bit, not picking it up with a pinky extended, filled hands. Now, third, it's very interesting the way this Torah portion rolls on. The most urgent responsibility then, right after all of this. So it starts off with the description of the pressed and beaten oil, which is a whole other sermon for a whole other time. It gives the ordination of the priests. It tells them about the incense offering, which again, another sermon for another time. The, the picture, the image of incense rising up. But then it finishes with this most important thing. The text transitions from the ordination to the substance of their calling. To the things their hands are supposed to do most often. And that is filling their hands with the actions of their service. 
And this is, again, something I have talked about before. It is immediately after the commands for ordination that God commands what is called the Ola Tamid, the perpetual burnt offering. This is the first commandment for the priesthood given immediately after their ordination. It's at Exodus 29, verses 38, 39. Now this is what you are to offer upon the altar. Two one-year-old lambs each day continually. You are to offer one lamb in the morning and the other lamb at dusk. Every morning and every evening, I taught you about the importance of these times of the offering of the Ola Tamid. I've noted that later in, cha- in Numbers chapter 28, God actually includes them among the Moadim. Twice daily offering is a Moadim, an appointment, as much as the Passover, as much as the Shabbat, as much as Sukkot, anything. The twice daily offering is included there as a Moadim. <clears throat> Since we no longer have a temple and an altar, I've taught before how prayer has filled that role for us. So our times of prayer have acquired the elements of the offerings, the Ola Tamid, the morning prayers and the evening prayers. <clears throat> but here we uh, come to understand the fundamental importance of why this Ola Tamid is here immediately as the first responsibility of the ordained priest. At Exodus chapter 29, verses 42 through 43, it is to be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before Adonai. There I will meet with you to speak with you there. I will meet with B'nai Yisrael there, so it will be sanctified by my kavod, by my glory. I'll read those highlights again. There I will meet with you. There I will speak with you. There I will meet with B'nai Yisrael. It will be sanctified by my glory. That is the tent of meeting. The importance of the Ola Tamid is the importance of the role of the priest. And remember what I said earlier. That that means y'all and me. Twice daily, the importance of the Ola Tamid is it is to maintain relationship. I'll say that again. The Ola Tamid is to maintain relationship. The filled hands of the priesthood were filled in order to maintain the relationship between God and his people. Stated another way and boiled down to its essence, the service of God is found in relationship. We relate to one another and we serve God in that way. These appointed times, these moadim, morning prayers and evening prayers, we as a nation of priests are instructed to do that. You know, prayer is not just about our needs. As I said up here, our duty to lift up the needs of others. It's a sacred duty. If, if you're serious about prayer, then prayer in the morning and prayer in the evening, and it should be about intercessionary prayer for us, for others, for your nation, for the world. That's what God expects of his priesthood. Relationship in the service of God is made full that way. So let's gather some of these points together that I've been talking about this morning. So first, ordination involves drawing your brother near. Second, it involves clothing him with kadosh garments. Third, it means filling your hands with service. But we can refine some of these points a little bit. Drawing near your brother must be done in love. Not dragging, not kicking and screaming, not cajoling. Drawing near your brother in love. Clothing them in priestly garments means showing them the chesed that God gave to you. Filling your hands means leaving no room for anything else. 
but service to God. Remember how this relates to my sermon of a month ago? That's what I was talking about then. If you're ever going back on and looking for sermons to review, I think that was February 4th, if my reckoning is correct. In that teaching, we learned that we had to empty our hand first in order to take our portion of the Passover lamb. This idea of filling our hands then complements that teaching. Hands filled with worthless things can't be filled with the service of God. It's pretty simple. Also, if we have seen service is not sometimes, but it is perpetual. God's priests were busy. With all of these things gathered together, God promises to meet with us and to talk with us and to consecrate where we are with his glory. So what is the practical message here for our lives? What can we do? Drawing your brother near. Don't revile others. Seek others' company. Don't separate, but congregate. Perhaps you could go say hi to someone you've seen here forever, but never really talked to. Perhaps you could take note of new people that come in the door to our services and welcome them. That is drawing a brother near. Clothing them in garments of righteousness. Share the love that God gave to you. Build relationships. Encourage the brother that you have drawn near to you. Give him words that build up. Be Yeshua to them. Filling your hands. Now here, we have many opportunities. This beautiful congregation is getting busier and busier by the day. And we need hands to be full so that we can do the things we need to do. A couple of weeks ago, Carlos made a plea for help for the booth. If he was here, I'd be embarrassing him, but he's not. So we have a stand-in. Rick, raise your hand. Rick has stepped up to volunteer. That booth is critical to our services. There's four chairs behind there, and each one of them has a duty each with its own tasks. We need to have at least three people trained on each one of those so that we're not scrambling if someone needs to go out of town or someone's sick. We can seamlessly have our services. It takes a great deal of many full hands to make our events happen. Each time a Moedim comes around, we begin the call for help. Purim is just Monday night. The spring Moedim are just weeks away. The volunteer sheet for helping with Pesach will be out. I'm not sure if we have one out for Purim for Monday night, but we do need a few more people to hand out cookies. It takes many full hands to maintain this facility. There are so many ways each and every one of us can contribute to that, can take up our ordination as a nation of priests and have our hands filled right here at Bessar Shalom. The youth and children's ministries are in perpetual need of help. They need more teachers. There is a dire need for men and women who are able to pick up people who cannot drive to services. And I want to emphasize we need both men and women to do that. Now, a word of caution, it's often said that 10% of the people do 90% of the work, and CVSS is no exception to that. So if you are already serving in some capacity, and I know you're out there, and I know you're feeling guilty, don't. I'm not talking to the 10% who are already working. I'm not trying to overburden people. It's others who may not have yet had the opportunity or taken advantage of the opportunity to feel the fulfillment of serving. That's who we're talking to. And as to the Ola Tamid, I'd like to strongly recommend that you avail yourselves of the men's and ladies' prayer groups. Go ahead and ask one of the men who regularly attend this prayer group and find out if the promise God made in this Torah portion isn't experienced continuously. Go ahead, talk to Sandy, talk to William, talk to Moshe. He comes. And find out if they think it's fulfilling. God carefully chose the phrase, fill the hands, when he commanded the ordination of Aaron. 
And that word male most often means fulfill. Serving in our in building our little community here, our house of God is fulfilling. Serving helps the server as much and actually more often than it does the served. God shows his love for us by taking action in our lives. We in turn must show our love by, for him by taking actions with our brothers and sisters. Our love of God is realized in our love for each other. It says in Colossians, and I'll just end with this. Chapter 3, verse 23, whatever you do, work at it from the soul. As for the Lord and not for people. For you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as a reward. It is to the Lord Messiah you are giving service. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Blessed Lord, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to dive into your word. I thank you, Lord, for giving us the picture of full hands. I thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to hear our prayers. I thank you, Lord, for this wonderful congregation and all these wonderful souls together. May you make us pull together, Lord. Pull together in our yoke, your easy yoke, to make our services the best they can be before your eyes. And I pray this all, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen.